Um, I have been asked to give a brief 10-minute overview on, well, the clinical perspective on JMML. So, of course, JMML is myeloproliferative neoplasm that may or may not have myelodysplastic features. It has predominant monocytic differentiation. That's where the name comes from. It is defined, among other things, by the absence of the Philadelphia chromosome or the BCR-able gene fusion. And <clears throat> there is a strong age predilection that, in that it affects infants and toddlers. Um, a typical clinical feature is massive splenomegaly. So here's just an example of what JMML looks like in the peripheral blood. So you have the occasional blast. You have some dysplastic monocytes over here. And this is an erythroid precursor. So the occurrence of um, erythroid or myeloid precursors in the periphery is also typical of JMML. Here are the main clinical features. So what's listed on the left side is a result of cytopenias, mostly. And then, as I said, you would normally have splenomegaly and heptomegaly. Skin infiltration, tonsil infiltration is also possible. Here's the hematology. Well, this is a proliferative disorder, so no wonder there's some degree of leukocytosis, although this need not be present. Of course, there's an increase in monocytes. Usually, you do have thrombocytopenia, some degree of anemia, <clears throat> although, again, in both cases, this is not mandatory. Well, so what I've told you so far is rather unspecific, and the diagnosis of JMML is notoriously difficult, and there's a broad differential diagnosis, which includes CML or other myeloproliferative conditions, as well as benign conditions such as congenital virus infections. And interestingly, we had a case at our institution where a baby presented with a picture that was 100% compatible with JMML, fulfilled all the diagnostic criteria, well, maybe except for the genetic criteria, <clears throat> but later it turned out that this baby, in fact, had a different congenital genetically determined disorder, namely leukocyte adhesion deficiency. Here's the cytogenetics. Your cytogenetics tests will come back normal in the majority of cases. Monosomy 7 without concurrent abnormalities is the second most frequent finding. And then in a minority of cases, you may have a complex aberrant carrier type with or without a 7Q abnormality. Well, you've been talking about this all day yesterday, so I'll only touch briefly on it. This is the distribution of the mutational subgroups in JMML. We find a PDPN11 lesion in approximately one-third of patients, KRAS or NRAS, and 25%. 10% of children have the diagnosis of neurofibromatosis type 1. This is a new discovery of this year, of course. So approximately 10% of children have Sybil lesions. And if you add up those numbers, we'll find that there's 20% of children where the mutation is still unknown. But I'm confident we are going to find out in the future. Well, back in 1998, some diagnostic guidelines have been proposed. And given that the differential diagnosis is not so easy, these are quite helpful. And I would say, even though they are approximately 12 years old, they are still valid and include some suggestive clinical features, in addition, some minimal laboratory criteria, which have to be fulfilled. So the BCR able must be negative. You have a defining absolute monocytosis, and a bone marrow blast count below 20%. This alone will not usually give you enough certainty to really make the diagnosis, so there are some additional criteria listed here. Now, when this was published back in 1998, NF1 was known, and the RAS gene lesions were known, but PDPN11 was unheard of, Sybil was unheard of. So we would now probably reorder the, let's say, the priority of these criteria. And I think this is a reasonable current diagnostic approach to JMML. So here's your category one criteria, and you will find the first three. I would say splenomegaly, there's, it's really an exception if a child with JMML does not have it and does not develop it in the course of the disease. 
And also, please keep in mind that children with JMML present at age zero to six in 95% of cases. So if you have a patient who is with a suspected diagnosis who is much older than that, well, there is some, some doubt is in place. And now, I think the second most important criteria come from genetic testing. So if you do find a somatic mutation in the RAS or PTPN11, or this needs updating, or the Sybil genes, or you can make the clinical diagnosis of neurofibromatosis, or if you do the NF1 testing, if you find a mutation, or your cytogenetics come back with monosomy 7, then you're pretty much set. So this and this is enough for the diagnosis. But as I mentioned, there are about 10, 15, 20 percent of children where all this comes back negative, and then you're still, then um, still need the help of those category three criteria.